Hey team, Dr. Jack Gordy here, and in the previous few videos, I introduced you to the immune system and how the immune system fights off disease. All very good things. But in the next few videos, I'm going to cover how the immune system can go wrong. And I'm going to start with one of my personal favorite topics because this is my research area and that is how inflammation can actually be a damaging process and contribute to disease and i've got a beautiful image here of the immune system essentially damaging the heart after um, a heart attack and so the in red here we have activated immune cells that are actually causing tissue damage so how are they doing that let's jump into it well, at first, I just want to quickly catch you up on the innate immune response, so then we can talk how it can be damaging. So it all starts with a resident immune cell. Those are immune cells that sit in our tissue, and macrophages are a very common one of that. So here we have a macrophage. There are more types, but here we have a macrophage sitting in the tissue with a blood vessel there. Now, they might recognize uh, a bacteria or tissue damage or a fungal infection or a viral infection, and they'll detect it through uh, cell surface and cytosolic receptors called pattern recognition receptors that are really just sniffing that extracellular fluid for a pathogen or tissue damage. And what they'll do is, after detecting it, they'll uh, signal inflammation through the release of inflammatory cytokines and other signaling molecules. Um, cytokines are protein signaling molecules. They are sort of the master communicators of the immune system. There's nearly 120 different cytokines, and IL-1 is one that I personally research, interleukin-1, IL-1 here, and it's a massive signaling molecule for inflammation. It signals both the vascular immune responses and immune cell recruitment and immune cell activation. So here we see the, the tight junctions in the blood vessels have now broken down. The blood vessel is now widened to get more blood to the site of um, the site of tissue damage or infection. And neutrophils and other immune cells are now migrating into the tissue. So the leaky blood vessels, why do they do that? Well, that lets humoral immunity like complement proteins and antibodies into the tissue and it also facilitates cell migration. Vasodilation increases blood flow we're going to have a lot of stuff going on so we need more oxygen more nutrients and more cells going to that site of infection or injury so we need that vasodilation and we need those immune cells to go in and start to clean up the pathogen or tissue damage and so here we can see some of the main responses here we get degranulation of the granular sites including neutrophils and in those granules are cytotoxic compounds for example uh, an enzyme that produces bleach neutrophils release an enzyme that produces bleach and bleach then sterilizes the area uh, but also the phagocytes such as neutrophils monocytes and of course my favorite the macrophage uh, begin to phagocytose eat stuff up so they can eat the damaged tissue and they can also eat the pathogens to deal with that um, and then they continue cytokine secretion so that's basically the inflammatory response. Then the resident immune cells, if they've done their job, will do anti-inflammatory cytokine signaling to cool everything down. So they'll start to release signaling molecules to turn off the immune response. However, inflammation can become maladaptive, can become damaging um, and contribute to disease when it is particularly chronic or excessive. Those are two of the main points in which inflammation can become a very damaging thing indeed. So an example I want to give you is a, a, a form of dementia called Alzheimer's disease that was discovered by this guy Alois Alzheimer's. Here's some histology there. He noticed a patient well over 100 years ago was suffering massive memory loss. This is one of the first and major symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, he described it in a woman. She was 52 years old. She had massive memory deficits, um, and then she deteriorated, lost her language, and eventually became so frail that she died. And he performed an autopsy, and he noticed that there was this pathogenic material in um, in the brain, and it was really just aggregates of protein that the body didn't seem to be able to break down. So he noticed these ugly aggregates in the brain that were very obvious and shouldn't have been there. 
Now I'm going to do a much deeper dive on Alzheimer's disease in later videos. So that was just a very quick primer. But another thing you noticed was there were clusters of non-neuronal cells around those pathogenic material there, that protein aggregate. There were clusters of non-neuronal cells. What we later learned, it almost took us 100 years to sort of really jump onto this, it was inflammation that was going on around those protein aggregates there was massive inflammation going on in the brain we can actually view that live in a living patient using uh, a special a special kind of medical imaging called pet imaging pet and here it is here and so this is quantifying the activation of the resident immune cells in the brain and what we can see is in a healthy control you typically don't have a lot of resident immune cells activated and in alzheimer's disease we see this massive activation of resident immune cells Cells. Now, when you think about some of the processes I just mentioned during inflammation and how that doesn't seem like a great thing to be happening in the brain. What we also know now is the amyloid, the protein aggregates, um, occur in your brain um, quite young, you know, around 50 years old. And typically Alzheimer's disease hits you in your 70s or 80s. So that protein aggregate and the inflammatory response to it has probably been happening for 20 years prior to symptoms occurring in Alzheimer's disease. So imagine some of those inflammatory processes that we talked about going on for 20 years inside your brain. That's chronic inflammation and it's chronic because we never get rid of the protein aggregates that are causing and the other protein species that are causing the disease so we can't seem to get rid of the thing that is causing the inflammation so the inflammation continues for decades Chronic inflammation is when inflammation can become maladaptive imagine some of those processes happening for example, imagine neutrophil degranulation causing bleach production in the brain for 20 to 20 to 30 years, right? That is going to be a very damaging process. And so we've actually researched some of this. Um, and often we use animal models for this. So this is a study that used an animal model of Alzheimer's disease. There's the author there, Volkman et al, um, 2019. And what they did was um, we have mice models of Alzheimer's disease. And essentially we took uh, rare genetic conditions that we know cause Alzheimer's disease. And we took those genes and we put them into the mice. So now the mice get Alzheimer's disease. Now in those mice, we did some more genetic engineering in this study where they delete the enzyme that's in neutrophils that produces bleach so if you delete that enzyme the neutrophil now cannot produce bleach so let's see what happens now what they did in the study was they put them through a maze task it's called the morris water maze um, but you know it's just a mouse performing a maze task right now here let's have a look at a normal mouse on the y-axis we've got the time taken to complete the maze and then down the bottom we've got the days of training now what we can see is a normal mouse goes along and it learns the maze so each time it can perform the maze faster and faster and faster so on average it gets much faster as it learns the maze now an alzheimer's mouse has a very poor memory remember that was one of the main symptoms of alzheimer's disease so if we look at an alzheimer's mouse they never actually get better at the maze because each time they enter the maze it is like it's the first time they've been in it they cannot remember how how to complete the maze. But now let's have a look at an Alzheimer's mouse in which the gene to produce bleach has been knocked out. So now these mice that have neutrophils, but those neutrophils cannot produce bleach. So what we can see there is that it performs much more similarly to the normal healthy mouse. So the disease was either prevented or at least probably just delayed a bit by deleting the gene that produces bleach. So here we can see in this animal model at least, the bleach production by neutrophils is contributing to Alzheimer's disease because bleach isn't just to toxic to bacteria, it is also toxic to our cells, including our neurons our brain cells so here you can see how chronic inflammation can definitely contribute to disease so that's how this process here can contribute to disease but there are other inflammatory processes that can contribute to disease too what about phagocytosis phagocytosis seems like a fairly good thing shouldn't it um 
it shouldn't it on average be uh really beneficial in a lot of diseases and it truly is but again we're talking in alzheimer's disease about 20 to 30 years of inflammation perhaps this phagocytosis can cause problems so here is a fluorescent image um, and in the green we have the innate immune cell of the brain called microglia and in the red we've got a neuron body here so a neuron body here a neuron body here now fluorescent microscopy when green and red overlap you get yellow so over here we've got a yellow microglia and over here we've got a yellow microglia what has happened and what we find is that it's the innate immune cell of the brain has actually eaten the neuron it's phagocytose the neuron and it can also phagocytose the connections between the neurons so um here we can see excessive phagocytosis could be contributing to disease um here we can see um we can see the massive overlap between a microglia and a neuron so we've got this yellow body there that's the innate immune cell i just slipped it there the innate immune cell of the brain is called the microglia i'm going to introduce that much better in a later video but yeah, so the innate immune cell sitting on top of the neuron, that's why it's yellow. And what we can see is the red slowly fades, and then eventually the innate immune cell migrates away, and there is now no neuron. So they watched this process live over the period of six days in the brain of a mouse. How did they do that? Well, they created what was called a cranial window, where you can um, essentially drill a hole... <laughs> Uh, in the skull and then full it full of a transparent resin so we can now observe using fluorescent microscopy live what is going on in the brain of a mouse which is absolutely amazing research so here they could see the microglia coming along and eating that neuron now my the um, innate immune cell wouldn't do that unless it was a, unless it was activated and inflamed so um, it's because it's been activated by the disease pathology of Alzheimer's disease that these innate immune cells are now eating neurons. Um, but what about this other process that we talked about, the, the blood vessel leakiness? Can that contribute to disease? And for this one, instead of going to a chronic disease, I'm actually going to look at a... Um, excessive inflammatory process when inflammation has gone too over the top and a great one to think about this is sepsis so here we have a blood smear and we can see these bacteria are all throughout the blood and that's what sepsis is sepsis is a systemic infection often bacteria throughout the blood when it is bacteria it's called bacterianemia um, any sort of emia means blood so it's just bacteria in the blood and so sepsis is when typically a local infection like on your toe or on your fingers that goes unchecked you don't deal with it it can then become septic and spread throughout your blood system and throughout your body now what i want you to imagine is that means that there are going to be pathogen associated molecular patterns pamps um, released all throughout your blood from that bacteria activating pattern pattern recognition receptors on innate immune cells all throughout your body which is going to cause a massive dump of cytokines all throughout your body which is then going to make all your vascular system inflamed and leaky what happens when your entire vascular system becomes leaky that might cause a problem so what we see when we look at sepsis let's have a look at blood pressure which is the pressure at which your blood flows around your body what we see is mean arterial blood pressure which is your average blood pressure um, steadily declines over a relatively short period during sepsis now why does this happen well think about a leaky balloon the pressure inside that balloon um, drops as it becomes leaky that's what's happening to your blood here your 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 all your blood vessels are becoming leaky because you have a systemic and Infection. so the fluid is rushing out of your blood into your tissues and so there is less fluid in your vascular space and so the blood pressure drops this is also worsened by that vasodilation where basically you can kind of imagine it the bigger the tube the lower the pressure if you put your thumb over the end of a hose you're narrowing that tube and the pressure increases so by widening the tube the pressure decreases by making it leaky the pressure decreases and this is a real problem so your heart can try to 
combat that. And so your heart rate can go faster and faster and faster to try and combat that blood pressure drop. It's like trying to pump up the balloon as it is leaking um, to try to keep your blood pressure up. Now, your heart can only get so fast and so it taps out and eventually we can end up with organ failure and one of the things that is causing that organ failure is hypo perfusion low blood flow also the blood flow can get to such a point that it begins to clot within the blood vessels and you can just end up with massive multi-organ failure and death sepsis is such a dangerous thing to get so here we can see how excessive inflammation can actually contribute to the disease. But, but, so that is how inflammation can contribute to the disease. But I really want to touch on that not all inflammation is bad. Okay, so um, let's have a look at this example here. So um, if you're in a car crash or you get a head injury, your brain essentially sloshes around the skull and it gets injured. And so it was contusions often on the front and back as the brain sloshes in and out in, inside your skull. Now this causes an inflammatory response and the brain begins to swell. And if you're swelling inside of a skull, the pressure can go up. So massive pressure can increase in your skull. For this reason, it was standard medical practice for decades to give immune suppressing steroids, anti-inflammatory steroids. They're essentially stress steroids, um, glucocorticoids or cortisol, you might have heard of. And so we give a drug that mimics a stress steroid in a human body to completely shut down the immune system. Now, a, a group of doctors got together and said, we haven't actually done a placebo controlled trial. I think we should do a placebo controlled trial on this. Now, the word on the street is that many doctors didn't want to enter the trial because they felt it was so obvious that the steroids were beneficial that it seemed negligent to not stop the pressure increasing inside your skull, to not stop that inflammatory process going on. But fortunately enough, these doctors managed to get enough hospitals recruited into the clinical trial to run a quite large clinical trial. So they ran um, a, a, a quite a large stage three clinical trial with about 5,000 patients in each group. So 5,000 were getting immune suppressing steroids and 5,000 were getting placebo. Um, and this is essentially the results. If you look at total deaths, you saw over a thousand died in immune suppressing in the immune suppressing steroid group, and under 900 died in the placebo group. It was an absolute difference of about 3.8 percent death rate. So that is a huge difference. You know, this is a meaningful impact, and it turned out that suppressing the inflammation going on was actually detrimental to the health of the patients, and that's because inflammation is normally good. It's normally not excessive, and it's normally not chronic. It's normally there to deal with the tissue damage, so it is normally a beneficial response, um, and it's only when we get that excessive and chronic uh, situation does the inflammation cause more harm than it solves. So that's a key point here. Inflammation can become maladaptive when it is chronic or excessive, but it's typically not. Right, so up next I'm going to go through another video about how the immune system can go wrong. And in this one I'll be touching on um, autoimmune diseases, which are a very interesting set of diseases. Thanks guys.